Thank you so much and welcome and good morning, everybody. It is, um, like was said yesterday by already quite a few, um, it's so nice to be back as a family of, of change makers and uh, reunite after, after so many years of not seeing each other except for on screens. Now, um, we have an exciting topic to discuss. Um, Foresight 2020, we're gonna be building on 20, two decades of uh, social innovation, as the title of this session says. And we have a stellar panel to do this. And um, I think what unites everybody on this panel is that there are system change makers. Individuals who are really focusing on the root causes of very challenging problems that we need to tackle if we want to see a world that's more just, more fair, more equal. And while the word innovation is in the title of this session, I think it's fair to say that while each of these individuals has been really creative and innovative in the way how they're tackling these problems, they also know that innovation alone is not enough. Because as, as we know, not every innovation is effective. And to change, to create profound change, you need to do more than, than innovate. You need to stay at it because we know that changing the realities on the ground, that changing the structures that, that perpetuate inequality, that perpetuate injustice, that perpetuate challenging problems is actually a long-term game that requires endurance. And so while, while these four amazing individuals come from very different sectors and are tackling very different problems, we're going to try to have a conversation that is in a way relevant, that is going to try to draw out some of the lessons that are relevant for anybody and everybody in this room who cares about creating profound change. Now, let me introduce them. But before doing so, let me actually say who I am. There was a short introduction just now. My name is Mabel van Oranje. I am a founder, as was said, of Girls Not Brides, which is a global partnership to end child marriage. Um, bringing together at the moment more than 1,600 NGOs, big and small, that are trying to work to create a world where girls don't marry before the age of 18 and all girls can live up to their potential. And Girls Not Brides, I think, is special. And I will be trying, as I introduce everybody, to highlight what makes these organizations special. I think what makes Girls Not Brides special is that it is um, what, what Bridgepan is calling an, a field catalyst in that amazing report that came out a month ago and that I recommend everybody to read. As we know, our, the Skoll Foundation calls it system orchestrators. I've been using the word backbone to describe Girls Not Brides because it is really the backbone of the movement to end child marriage, bringing together not just civil society, but also actually bringing together other actors that are needed if you want to end child marriage, including governments and media and, and religious and traditional leaders, etc. And it is also, in a way, an information and learning hub for, for work to end child marriage. Now, over to these four amazing individuals. Let me quickly introduce them in alphabetical order. And I'm going to actually use my glasses because in these four few years that you guys didn't see me <laughs> live, I did age a tiny bit. As Archbishop Tutu would say, I'm not as young as I look. Um, anyway, so Greg is, um, is the CEO and founder of M Pharma. He's from Ghana. And M Pharma transforms community pharmacies into primary healthcare centers. And they are at the moment monthly um, serving more than 220,000 patients who receive medical care through that network operating in eight countries. And what I think makes M Pharma so, so interesting as an organization is that while it is tech driven and when there, it, it operates a vendor managed inventory, in the end it's the patient, it is the, the person who, who, you know, deserves the help, who is really central in everything that happens. And I think they're a great, op I mean, we, this is a time where we talk a lot about decolonialization of aid, or what I think is a better term of locally led development. And I think they're a great example of how you can actually do locally led development at serious scale. So we'll be unpacking that. Then we have Savina Hussein from Educate Girls from India. Now, the name says it all. Safina is educating girls. Her organization is educating girls. And that is badly needed because, I mean, it's incredible, but in 2023, we still have 127 million girls who are not in school. And this is a major human rights abuse that is absolutely unacceptable. 
Now, her organization, in the 15 years of its existence, has been serving more than 1.2 million girls, helping these girls to get into school. And what makes them special, I think, in the way they do it, is that, that they are really looking for community-led solutions. So they're finding these solutions, they're making it possible for these solutions then to be implemented. And by doing so, they haven't only helped this more than a million girls to go to school, but they have also created and mobilized an army of more than 18,000 gender champions in ton loads of villages all over India. And so you can imagine what kind of change that is helping to create when people start looking different at the values of girls. Tiana is from the Center of, for Technology and Civic Life in the United States, and she is connecting, or her organization and she, are connecting Americans with the information that they need to become and to stay civically engaged, and also to ensure that elections will be more professional, more inclusive, and more secure. The way they do it, and what makes them special, I think, is that they really work in cross-discipline, cross-sector, and in a multi-actor way. So they have a team that, all, that includes trainers, but also civic technicians, researchers, election administrators, uh, data experts, and then they're working with election officials, etc. And they do that in a series, on a series of issues, including the actual operations of elections, the cyber security that comes with it, information and communication, and obviously, as we heard yesterday in the opening ceremony, a lot of myths and uh, communication as well as what they're trying to tackle, and they're looking at policy issues. And by doing all that, they're trying to foster, obviously, a more informed and engaged democracy, and trying to make sure that basically uh, US elections will actually get modernized. Last, definitely not least, Willie, from Root Capital, um, and he and his organization are partnering with small, growing agricultural businesses in developing economies by providing them capital, providing them with capacity building, and to make sure that they get better access to markets. Now, the beauty of this thing is that when these entrepreneurial business-led organizations succeed, they also help to transform the local communities in which they operate with long-term effects. Lifting people out of poverty, advancing climate, climate action, contributing to gender equity, and creating jobs for the next generation. And so what I love about this is that in the two decades, that they, two more than two decades that they have been operating, they have been leveraging a platform of hundreds of agricultural businesses countless smallholder farmers to not only bring in then other capital and other, and other service providers, but also to help to foster a network of, of industry-wide collaboration. And all that is not making only in helping these agricultural businesses to be more impactful, but actually transform the societies and the communities they work in. So a nice leverage effect, I think. Anyway, now you know who is on the panel. Now you know what, what, what their organizations are up to. So we're going to go into the conversation. And I'm going to start by asking the panelists a few questions, and then we're going to open it up. Because, I mean, this room is obviously filled with people who have tremendous lessons to share as well. Um, I mean, you're all amazing. There's only going to be one key rule, and that is all these panelists have agreed to be brief and brilliant. And once we open this up, I expect all of you to do exactly the same. Be brief and be brilliant. We're going to start by looking back. And we're not going to hang too long in the looking back because, you know, and we're not going to talk forever about their organizations, but we're going to look back by, I'm going to ask each of, of the panelists to basically reflect, despite the fact that they come from different sectors, all having worked on this big system change, what are two or three success factors of these last 20 years of, I mean, most of you, not all of you, have been around for, for almost 20 years or even longer. What have been the success factors that have made the work that you've been doing uh, actually so meaningful that you got on stage today? Um, <laughs> let, uh, let me start with Greg. Well, I think, you know, from, from the m standpoint, I would boil it down to just one, people. 
I think that as social innovators, we start with a great idea, but really we are not the engine that drives this transformation. And I do not think M Pharma will be where it is today without the people that have joined that mission. I had a saying when we said M Pharma that the people we hire should be much better than me. In fact, they on their own should be able to establish M Pharma. The only difference between them and myself is my ability to mobilize financial resources. That should be the only difference. And that has been sort of the journey we've been on trying to build what I think, and I'm biased, the most talented um, workforce uh, driving change in the healthcare system in Africa. And how big is that workforce? And to which extent are also the pharmacies that you're working with, do you count them as your workforce in a way, or? No, so the, our direct workforce is about 1,200 people. If we add our franchise network and the workforce within our franchise uh, network, then we'll be probably close to like 3,000 people. So even though we wouldn't include them as direct FTs, obviously their employment is based off on the financial success that M Pharma creates uh, by operating their pharmacies. Um, and so we are also very much invested, because for us, when patients walk into any of our pharmacies, even if it's a franchise pharmacy, the health worker there is the direct representation of M Pharma to that patient. And if that patient leaves that pharmacy without having the type of experience we want every patient to have, then that affects our ability to achieve our own mission. And so we, we do not include them from how I count, I'll count FTEs, because I don't pay their salaries, but FTEs are them from 1,200, add franchise network, close to 3,000 people. And Greg, you, you, I love it that you're hiring people who you think are in a way better than yourself, but you're the one who had that big vision to create this and also has set, created a culture and a tone of what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. How do you make sure that these thousands, you know, and all these people that work with Root Capital actually, um, uh, sorry, and with M Pharma actually gets also kind of adopt that vision? Yeah. I mean, I wish I had, uh, I feel like I, I'm always learning um, how to do that because it's not easy. You know, there's how you do it when you are just 50 people that's how you do when you're 100 people, 500 people. And I think that when I look at what really I spend a lot of my time doing is over communicating. I'm constantly, I think actually my mom had a joke, uh, not a joke, actually it was quite serious, at uh, Christmas, and she, all our siblings, we go home for Christmas, and she looked at everyone, we're gonna have dinner, and she said, I want you all to tell me about what's been going on in your life, but it cannot be about work. And she looked at me and said that, and I was like, well, then, <laughs> I guess I'm going to be quiet this whole dinner. Um, but it's really been the bane of my existence. Sometimes it's been very emotionally taxing because I've had to give my all. I, it's just, just not a single day that I'm walking around where I am not thinking about M Pharma. In fact, practically some of the things I do, I do these daily snippets where every single day I'll write and just tell people how my day was, what I worked on, just try to remind people how the little actions we take every single day compounds to create a big change that we wanna transform. But it's been a very big time investment um, to just keep that engine. And even at that, I still fail um, because there are certain things I'm like, wow, why is this happening in the organization? And I didn't know, but I, I just learned from that and just keep improving. Well, thank you. Savina, what about you, two or three success factors? Yeah, first of all, I mean, I hope my team is not watching and listening to this because I can't do any of this, like the, the daily reflections, the snippets. I mean, oh my God, this is just, uh, I'm going to take notes, Greg. I guess it's fabulous. Um, I tend to be much more messy and just hope for the best. <laughs> <Don't guess laughs> um, but I think like looking back, so I'm Safina Hussain. I educate girls, started 15 years ago. Um, and grown from like a 50 village sort of test run to about, I think this year it's gonna be almost 25,000 villages, full-time employees about 3,000, Team Balika volunteers, the gender champions is almost I think over 18,000 now. So just like massive scale very, very, very quickly. But the three key pillars of this, and I see it as a triangle in my mind. At the top of this triangle is the girls. And this laser sharp focus on the out of school girl from day one till today hasn't shifted. 
no mission drift, no mission creep. So whether we did the development impact bond, the result metric was finding an out of school girl and bringing her back into school. Um, whether it was, you know, our, we did a lot of sort of technology work and now we can actually predict the number of out of school girls per village, uh, which is like insane. But the focus is to predict where are the out of school girls. Uh, and that laser focus has meant that we've actually realized that India, which has over 700,000 villages, only 5% of the villages, about 35,000 villages, have 40% of out of school girls. So it's just like the, this sort of laser, laser, laser sharp focus and never move your eye from, from that uh, end point. The second piece is I think what you were talking about is the community ownership. Um, even though we have like 3,000 employees and you know, 18, close to 20,000 volunteers, over 95% of them actually come from the same states, the same districts, the same villages. We have a slogan which says, you know, my village, my problem, I am the solution. And it really has to be rooted in that, in that community ownership. So that's one part of it. And the second is that we actually stay in a village for a minimum of six to eight years, which means that you are actually hand-holding and working across eight to 10 cohorts, which is generational change. Because it doesn't happen. You can't parachute in, parachute out, and do one-year projects and say, oh, you know, touched and transformed everyone. I mean, that really doesn't happen. The third aspect is obviously the government, and you can't do either of those without the partnership of the government. So actually working only, no parallel delivery system, work only and embed everything that you're doing and learning back into the system. So I would say those are kind of like the, the three things. Wonderful. Tiana, what about you? Um, again, I'm Tiana Epps Johnson. I lead the Center for Tech and Civic Life, and our work is focused on making sure that U.S. elections work in a way that are professional and inclusive and secure. And I think um, my number one answer to this was shared in the introduction, which is collaboration is really at the core of everything that we do. But I think it's helpful to un understand structurally a little bit about U.S. elections to understand why that's so critical. Um, unlike most countries in the United States, we don't have a centralized election authority. And so rather than having sort of a centralized place that's responsible for the rules and helping with the logistics of elections and helping to make sure best practices are happening at polling locations and with all of the processes, instead we have about 8,000 local offices at each city and county level that's independently responsible for administering elections. And so that means about 8,000 different flavors of what it might look like to go to a polling location and cast a ballot or the information that you receive. Um, and some of these offices, actually the vast majority, are only staffed by maybe two people. Um, and they don't only administer elections, although this is year-round work, they also have other government responsibilities. So some of them are responsible for things like marriage licenses, or they're the front lines of our motor vehicles agencies in addition to administering elections. What that all creates is many dynamics that are really challenging to have an experience across the United States where there's parity in how people access democracy. Um, and it also means that all of these folks at the really local level are working to administer elections, oftentimes reinventing the wheel because there's not a lot of shared practice. Take um, on top of that, um, since uh, the election when Vice President Gore ran, the process of administering elections has become much more complex because of the ways technology and other factors have impacted the sector. Um, so, you know, today, uh, maybe 20 years ago, someone who was an election administrator at the local level, most of their responsibilities were administrative. They needed to be able to do things like make sure there are enough voting locations and that they were staffed properly, um, and to get that information out maybe in the local newspaper. But today, not only do they have to do those core things, they need to be on the front lines of cybersecurity against nation state actors, even those people that are in a rural election office with two staff. They need to be able to communicate effectively to all of the public through digital means in a massive misinformation environment. So at CTCL, recognizing that complexity, um, we really focus on bringing together people who are expert on law and policy and operations of elections and security and technology, all to come together around a shared strategy to support these local public servants with best practices and tooling and resources so that we might move away from a system where your access to democracy depends on your zip code. And so having that really multi-sector approach that doesn't think about um, 
elections and silos has been really transformative to making sure that these officials have um, the wraparound skills and support and community to most effectively serve the folks in their communities um, in ways that are meaningful. Beautiful. Thank you. And thanks for that little lesson. I hadn't realized that in the United States it's that bad. So <laughs> I'm very, very grateful that you're doing this. environment. <laughs> Um, let's, uh, let's go to Willie now. Um, what about your lessons? So, honor to be up here, um, and I'm so happy to be back in Oxford. Uh, I'll, I'll highlight three success factors for us, looking back, looking way back. So I'd say the first one uh, is a continuity of kind of a fierce focus on our client, on our core partner. Um, and that is, over the past 20 years or so, our tactics, our strategy has evolved dramatically. Uh, but we have focused all of our social innovation work around partnering with agricultural small and growing businesses, as you mentioned, because they're such engines of impact, and they're like the ultimate. Think farmer cooperatives and village-based processors and millers that buy and aggregate the crops of thousands of farmers. They're the ultimate proximate actor, so deeply rooted in local community, committed to sustainable land management. They can uh, accompany farmers year in and year out for, uh, with insights and technology and resources. They can drive equity deep into their operations and their policies and their culture. So we've spent, you talked about laser sharp uh, focus, we've spent 20 plus years deeply listening to and accompanying these agricultural businesses in their communities and really um, evolving our products and our innovations and our strategy alongside and in response to their needs and to their highest priorities. So that's success factor one. It's just that, that fierce focus on, on, um, on those agribusinesses. I'd say the second one, and this is something that um, we've thought a lot about. Um, I, we, I think, gained clarity early on as a social enterprise on what's our, um, what's our end game. In other words, what is it, what's the specific role that a, that a social enterprise, a nonprofit, intends to play to, a, to address um, the, 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 a deep social challenge in the world and in terms of that overall solution. So for us, in our case, it has always been replication and adaptation of our work so that other institutions and practitioners would crowd in to the market. So that's our scale enabler, replication and adaptation. Why? Because I'd say earlier than many, we identified this massive so-called missing middle between microfinance and the banks um, that was particularly large in agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa today, the missing middle financing gap for agricultural small and medium enterprises, agri-SMEs, is $65 billion a year. So there's no way we would ever be the scaled solution ourselves. So it was all about how do we proactively crowd in other organizations uh, to do that. So um, that's a lot of, we've been doing, you know, since day one, lots of testing and piloting and hardwiring and blueprinting of our work so others will crowd in. And I'd say, and, and importantly, that has really meant that we need to focus on additionality as a North Star. Always pushing the innovation frontier so that we are at the head of the curve and continuing to lead as folks crowd in to the marketplace. And so that leads me to a third success factor, finally, is um, what we like to call collaboration, or better said, pathological collaboration which has been really at the heart of all of our systems, entrepreneurship and systems organization, I mean orchestration work. And so the driver here really is realizing pretty early on that filling that missing middle was gonna take two things. One, I already talked about it. Crowding in a robust ecosystem of other, of other actors, capital providers, capacity builders, but doing so really proactively, ambitiously at the global scale so that you have thousands of investors and lenders and capacity builders you have tens and tens of thousands of agricultural businesses that are thriving in millions and millions of people. So that's thing one. Thing two was you need a heck of a lot of so-called blended capital. So bringing philanthropy and impact investing and guarantees and public-private partnerships in order to absorb the risk and to pay for the action learning and the R&D that needs to happen to develop the marketplace. So lastly, I'd say that has led us to a conclusion a long time ago that we need to build a sector-wide evidence base in order to, 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 to move the kind of capital that's required. Uh, and we need to create pathological kind of platforms of collaboration, sharing practices, sharing tools, sharing learning, sharing failures, 
Uh, we need to do advocacy to bring all this stuff up to government and policy and markets uh, and so on. So we have, um, we're proud co-founders of two collection active platforms, collection act action platforms. One is called uh, Andy. Many of you know the Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs. We co-founded that, played a, a, an important role in leadership for many years. And then the Council on Smallholder Agricultural Finance, which was, Andy was 2009, the CSAF was in 2012. And those are really important ways that we're able to just influence way beyond our own factory gates mm -hmm. and really maintain that laser sharp focus on our, on our clients. Wonderful, thanks for sharing those, those lessons. Now, we all know there is no success without challenges, bumps in the road, things that don't go as you thought, assumptions that were wrong, failures. And so before we start looking at the future, I would love to hear from each of you with the knowledge you now have. Can you mention something you wish that you, your organization, had done differently? Uh, Greg, can I start with you again? <laughs> sure. Um, I, I, have, I had a mentor who once, um, said to me, when you see a gap in a market, make sure there's a market in the gap. Mm -hmm. And I think that <laughs> <Very cool. laughs> as, a, as a social enterprise, um, you know, you, you lead with the emotions. You lead with sort of this injustice that you want to solve. Um, and I think that the, the difference between being a nonprofit social enterprise and a for-profit social enterprise is that as a for-profit social enterprise, you are, your goal is to build market-based solutions to address that injustice. And some of my biggest failures have been when I forgot that even though I want to actually solve these problems, I am also a for-profit social enterprise. And I need to make sure that I do not only lead with the problem and the injustice, but also understand my own you know, limits to say that maybe this is not a problem I should not tackle. And I think that I would have saved much more money and probably multiplied um, my impact in other areas that we had pioneered more market-based solutions if we had stick to that core. So for me, it has always been just reminding myself to stick to the core because mm -hmm. there's so much injustice and there's a temptation to try to spread yourself too thin to be able to tackle because you always see adjacent problems to the core problem you're solving and just learning to not maybe get too excited to solve another problem um, has been a very big lesson and you know the failures in those has sort of helped me. Thanks. Safina. Yeah, I think um I think one of the big learnings uh, for me has been that the like, last 15 years have been very action-oriented. Every year, I mean, we were adding first 1,000 villages a year, then it went to 3,000, and then I think last year it's like 5,000, and next year we're thinking 9,000 villages. It's like, so you're hiring people, you're setting up offices, you're setting up, like, I mean, it's very, very, very action-oriented. And like 15 years later, now when I kind of look back, I feel like I wish I had actually balanced that action orientation with enough sort of reflection in terms of writing and sharing. Because somebody recently I met and they, they mm. sort of, they said, you know, we were looking you up and we researched you guys and so much has been written about Educate Girls and yet so little by you. Mm -hmm. mm. And I was like, oh my God, we, you know, in our own voice, we should have been reflecting and writing and and sharing that, uh, and I think if I was to go back and redo it, or like now, now, next 15 years, that's something that I will, I think, definitely think about a lot more, is that reflection and that sort of writing documentation uh, and sharing that beyond. It's interesting because it really resonates with the work I've seen around ending child marriage. You get so busy building that movement and bringing governments in and bringing others in, and, how, and it seems so obvious how you do it, and actually, I think some of these things are, are not maybe as obvious as they seem and to actually share like, because I think one of the things is you need to then identify champions who actually help to bring, in the case of working with government, bring other governments in. And, and some of these things, they seem very obvious, but if we don't actually 
acknowledge them and share them, it's hard for others to, to replicate those tricks. But, and also I think now I'm beginning to realize that also having your voice, a lot of the things that are written about us are written by others in their voice, uh, right? And our voice is a very different, it's a very grounded, it's a very field, ground zero voice. And I think not inhabiting that is something that we're sort of short selling ourselves. And so just, you know, if I read a report by like a big consulting agency, it reads very different to the way my work authentically feels. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I feel like that kind of is also really important. It's not just simply the documentation of it, but to have it in the voice of a man who was also married at the age of six. Mm. To, to have it written in the voice of a woman who was married at the age of 12, you know, uh, or who didn't go to school, or, or all of those. And I think to inhabit that is, is actually kind of key and important. Tiana, what about you? I uh, really resonate what each of you said, because when I think about my own reflection, at least on this question, it has to do with spreading myself too thin and needing to find spaciousness for things like reflection and writing. Um, CTCL, I founded with two other co-founders nine years ago. Um, and for the first five years, I was an operations team of one. Um, I'm, we did not have a fiscal sponsor. We had a bookkeeper, but I was literally fundraising, doing the work of an executive director, managing folks, and also doing QuickBooks at night. Um, and that was completely unsustainable. And the, there's a lot of things that were challenges with that, but I think that when I really reflect on it, one of the core things is that it impacted my confidence in a serious way. Um, and that was because I was jumping from thing to thing so quickly. I needed to be doing, you know, making sure that we had a perfect audit um, during like one part of my day, and then the next day I needed to be able to speak about our vision as an organization. And those are very different parts <coughs> of your brain. Um, and in none of my days did I have time to sit and reflect and write and feel visionary and pull together all of the pieces. And ultimately, not only was I doing too much, but I also didn't feel like I was doing the right things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think if I were to go back, I would have listened to folks who were encouraging me to bring on an executive assistant or someone to help fill out our ops um, uh, stack a little bit earlier because as soon as we did that and expanded our leadership team to include an ops director, not only um, did um, she just bring perspective that's allowed us to grow and become an organization that's doubled three times over the last as many years, um, but it also has meant that I've been able to really um, sit in the work around strategy and vision um, that in, has allowed us to really grow into this backbone for the election sector um, that um, is beyond me just really being focused internally only on our own organization. Thank you, Willie. So for, for me, I think, um, I love this question because one of the most important things I think all of us represent is having been through the ringer enough times to know what works and what doesn't work. And so I would come back to something I mentioned earlier, which is our focus, and necessarily so because of replication adaptation as our end game on additionality mm -hmm. and trying to re-architect ourselves, sometimes too quickly and too often can be super exhausting for, for the team and, and can lead to a lot of burnout. So really focusing on what's, what's the, the next frontier, what do we need to drive um, forward, and at the same time, even 20 years plus into the organization, some people on the team, and I've got a couple of colleagues here in the audience, feeling like we still feel like a startup. When are we ever really gonna grow up? <laughs> because, and, and maintaining that light-footedness is so critical and at the same time, you need to be able to create that kind of stability for yourself. So one example there is like thinking about additionality 10 plus years ago, how can we go where others aren't going right now is diversifying into many different value chains. And in hindsight, too many. And re-architecting ourselves and taking on a heck of a lot more risk than we could afford at the time. So having to actually recognize a lot of losses driven by this imperative around additionality and having to get smaller to get smarter. And just in general, to my colleagues in the, uh, in the audience, that re-architecting is important, but it needs to be done with process and systems and um, patience and robustness. Otherwise, people uh, get, get burned out. Yeah. It's interesting because all of you obviously work really 
looking at the roots and at the, the local and reflecting on, on my work over the last decade plus on, on ending child marriage, I find there's always that tension between how much do you focus on the local, which is where real change happens. I mean, in the end, child marriage is a social norm and, and the reasons why it happens are defined locally. Is it a lack of education? Is it poverty? And you need to address it locally. And at the same time, you can't do that. And the issue was getting very little attention until, until a decade or so ago. If you don't also tackle the global and make sure that at the UN and the ANGA and at you know, events like this and other events, the issue is actually acknowledged and that donors become aware that, they, that this is something that needs funding, et cetera. And, to, and you need policies, although policies alone, we know laws alone are not going to solve this. And so how do you get that balance right? I find this something that, in, I mean, you've all in your way been trying to, to create these bigger systems as well. And it's, it's quite challenging, I find. But let us look a little bit then forward, and then we'll, then we'll open it up. Um, there, I mean, this term, the polycrisis world in which we're living, is something that I've heard so much in the last few weeks. You know, this idea of we have so many crises going on at the same time, economic uh, inequalities, uh, the climate, etc. cetera. Um, we, we also know that, obviously, um, that there might be a whole lot of unforeseen things that are going to happen in this world that we can't even imagine. At the same time, all of you have, have clear strategies, clear visions. Uh, you've tested your methods. You know what you need to continue doing and doing more of and, and keep adjusting. Um, so if you look at the future, obviously you're not going to change everything in terms of how you do things overnight. But, but looking ahead at the coming 20 years, what, with the little prediction power that we have, what do you think you will be doing more of? And what do you think you will be doing less of? <laughs> Greg, shall we start with you again? <laughs> um, you know, I, when I was coming uh, on this panel, one of the questions you know, I asked myself um, is, you know, what if in the next 20 years, the biggest companies in the world are the ones established to deliver social services? Mm -hmm. right? What if in the next 20 years, you know, we have a rethink of how companies go public. Imagine creating a stock exchange for social innovation, mm -hmm. where social mm -hmm. enterprises can go on a stock exchange and list, because actually the return on investment is beyond just a financial return. And the investors that buy shares in companies on this stock exchange build for social innovation and derive their returns uh, using some of the uh, the impact that they, they, they generate um, uh, through those companies. So when I think about the next 20 years um, for myself, for M Pharma, I hope in 20 years I'm still running M Pharma. Um, that would be a great thing. But I think, you know, as I look forward, there's a really important thing for me that I want to make sure we continue to institution, which is the language matters in describing the solutions that we are offering. And one thing that I had to sort of change mentally is how we describe those we serve, from beneficiaries to customers. Because if I call someone a beneficiary of my service, it creates this power imbalance. It's like, you should be grateful that I am here. You should be grateful that I am giving you a service. But if you are my customer, actually, you, I'm not doing any favor. It's like, I don't go to a restaurant, order food and say, be grateful I'm here to buy your food. You're like, no, like I am cooking a great meal and you are paying me for this great meal. And if the service is great, maybe I'll come back again and come back again. And I think in the world of social innovation and social enterprises, we too often talk about beneficiaries. And I, believe, I hope that the next 20 years, the thing, and that is not even about M Pharma, ever is that we start shifting that we see our end users from beneficiaries to customers, because that gives them agency. <coughs> and we then have to continue to improve what we are selling, because they should have options on what they should actually, uh, who they should get these services from. I love that, love it. Savina. 
Yeah, so the future for me, because I, <laughs> this is, a, I felt like it's a question like directed at me, because <laughs> I, I actually stepped off as CEO of Educate Girls last year. So I am really in this thing saying, what does the future bring? Um, and I think some of the things that I've kind of been struggling with is like as a CEO, you occupy like this view from like 40,000 feet, right? I mean, you're up there and you have to run the machinery and all the rest of it. And I think, and, and you're right, this poly crisis, like so much has changed because of the pandemic and things. So for me, the first thing was to like sort of reorient with ground zero. Mm -hmm. So during the pandemic, I actually lived in a, in a village for about eight months. I was teaching inside the hut of a tribal woman and like just teaching kids and reorienting, saying, what does the view look like from ground zero? Because as a CEO, you've been away from that view for a while. Uh, and post that, once it's opened up, I've just been traveling village after village and meeting girls and seeing where are they today because the world is changing so rapidly that the reality is shifting very rapidly. Uh, so I think part of it is, is just that. And, and you know, it's unfortunate, but I'm going to like remote areas and sitting with a group of like 15, 20 girls and almost all of them are married mm -hmm. because the weddings were cheaper during the lockdown. You could only invite 10, 20 people, you know. So parents were like, ah, this is the time. It saves money and it made economic sense. I mean, it's terrible what you're seeing just again and again and again. Uh, so no school, education interrupted. So I think the, the big change for me is to come down to that ground zero, inhabit that, absorb that for a while before you even start to think about the future. So it's kind of like learning for the last 15 years. It's unlearn and then relearn and rebuild. <coughs> And I think that's the mm. sort of structure that I'm trying to kind of create for myself. Cool. Thank you. Anna, what about you? Um, I'll start somewhere darker, and I'm an optimist, so <coughs> I'll end somewhere lighter on this question. Um, I, I mentioned the public servants that I get to work with, local election officials in counties and cities across the United States. Since the 2020 election, their lives have gotten much more challenging um, because of the disinformation environment related to elections. Mm -hmm. So the folks that I work with who have been in these roles, some of them for decades and decades, since the 2020 election have been subject to death threats, um, harassment. Um, one in three election officials currently don't feel safe in their jobs. Um, and so it is a, an environment that's very similar to what public health workers, for example, in the United States have experienced. Um, and so we're seeing attrition rates um, of these public servants at anywhere between um, 25 and 40 percent right now, leaving the field. And so the one thing that I think is going to just continue to be a part of our work that is a newer layer, um, both as an organization and with the folks that we support, um, is understanding how to navigate um, in a disinformation environment and build towards a, a more trusted information <coughs> ecosystem. And practically, one of the things that that means is as an organization that's really focused before almost solely on implementation support, so helping these government officials implement elections in ways that are excellent, we now need to continue to be able to provide that support, but also employ narrative strategies because that is um, a piece of what we need to be able to shift in order to keep these folks safe, um, to retain um, professionals in the field and attract new professionals in the field, and also to shift the uh, feelings around distrust that we're experiencing right now in our, in our elections, and I think that learning how to navigate in a disinformation environment is something that's uh, really similar um, for folks across different sectors. The piece that for me is light um, is that it also means in our strategy, it's really important for us that we are centering things like joy and celebration and community um, to support those local election officials that we work with so that they, in this moment that's incredibly challenging, are not feeling alone, that they have the support networks not only substantively to do the work, but also to focus on their well-being. Um, and that means that we get to have convenings where we not only are focusing on best practices for cybersecurity, but we're also doing things like celebrating these incredible public servants for the heroic work that they've had, had to do. And when I get feedback from our programming from election officials who say things like, I didn't realize that I needed to hear that type of praise. 
it was healing. I feel like I can go back and do this work longer. Um, those are the things that are, um, feel like they are intangible, but they're core to the ways that we design our program so that, that, is, that healing is a part of getting to support them in their work serving voters. And I think that centering joy and community and support because of the challenging environments that we're working in is going to also need to be a core part of strategic <coughs> programming for organizations. That makes sense, but it's very impressive that you're thinking about that as well. Really? So I highlight two things that we're gonna do more of going forward. One is fully embracing intersectionality. So by, by that, um, I think f for us, that's about tackling multiple development challenges simultaneously, in our case, from the same integrated platform and through lots of partnerships with other practitioners because none of us have time to address these things in silos. So for us, the, our 2030 um, guiding question is how do, how do we help create prosperous, inclusive, and resilient communities in the face of all of these intersecting and converging negative trends that are hitting like every part of society. So we are halfway through right now as we're capital a five-year strategic plan that's all about partnering with these agricultural businesses and their communities at the intersection of, uh, in our case, four um, intersecting impact pathways. So it's maybe obviously access to finance, bankability, climate action, Mm -hmm. gender inclusion, and next-gen jobs, and really working in an integrated fashion across all of those. And maybe just to give you an example, on the, we, we launched um, in 2012, so we're celebrating our 10th anniversary of our Women in Agriculture Initiative. And so this is about investing in uh, very proactively uh, women-led and gender-inclusive agricultural businesses and really appreciating and strengthening all the roles of women in agriculture from farmers to workers in a processing plant to the hidden um, influencers, middle management, of course, to leaders and entrepreneurs and boards of directors. And where the real power is, is seeing kind of unlocking the potential of an agricultural business to equalize and level the playing field for women in terms of everything from access to land to credit to training to technology and, and increasing significantly, and we see it all the time, opportunities for leadership, opportunities for participation, opportunities for, for economic um, betterment of women. So just quickly, um, where we've, like results thus far over the past 10 years, again, in the context of intersectionality. Um, last year, we financed, writ large as Root Capital, over 200 businesses close to two, $200 million in credit dispersed. Wait, don't forget the brief and brilliant rule. Ah, uh, yes, okay, sorry. So, um, women in agriculture as an example, uh, I'll, come, uh, I'll leave it there on that one. The next thing I would highlight is a lot more um, participation in coalitions, broad mm -hmm. and proactive participation in coalitions, and in our case, really focused on climate action in that context. So, the, the deal is that um, there is a, uh, it is a uh, existential threat to 2.5 billion people who depend on agriculture as their primary source of income, climate change. Um, and the great paradox is that there is a mountain of evidence, overwhelming evidence that local people, rural communities, uh, smallholder farmers, indigenous populations are the most effective guardians of those of the richest landscapes, landscapes on earth and carbon and species diversity, and that they need to be at the very heart of any nature-based solution to the climate crisis, but they are not. Um, it's like 1.7% of global climate finance goes to smallholder farmers. So we are launching this week um, here at Skoll with eight other Skoll awardees and a number of other organizations outside of Skoll, um, what we're calling the Cash Coalition, Climate Action for Smallholders Coalition. Right which is all about working pathologically together to change, as James Mwangi of Skoll Foundation Board says, to change the narrative around smallholder farmers from climate victim to climate vanguard. And how do we work together to radically increase climate finance to smallholder farmers, to local communities? And so we're gonna do that as we, I talked about with Andy, Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs, Council on Smallholder Agricultural Finance, Climate, uh, climate Action for Smallholder Coalition is kind of for us, what it's all about going forward, is that intersectional? So I think anybody who wants to know more about that coalition or who actually wants to become part of it should come after this session, seek Willie out and make sure that you, you get involved because this sounds like 
a powerful way to, to tackle that, that challenge. Yeah. We're going to open it up for questions and comments. Um, as you were just reminded, the rule is brief and brilliant. <laughs> there you go. Thank you so much. And I can't see faces very well, and I can't read name cards from there. So you forgive me if I don't properly introduce you, but just say who you are, and then make your question or comment, please. Well, thank you so much. It's really Not yet. Yeah. Keep, keep going. They will switch it on. <coughs> All right. Uh, my name is Kiza Hussein from Rwanda. I would literally speak for the most dis disadvantaged people here. Uh, it's really phenomenal to hear from you, really wonderful, and the solutions you've come up with that are addressing really serious challenges in the communities are phenomenal. But also going back, it's common place that people who live in, in the low developed countries live on less than a dollar or less than a pound per day. So as social entrepreneurs, when you're trying to innovate solutions or tools that can address challenges, you're thinking about also sustainability, or what he said, stick to the core. You want to make sure that the tools can really uh, bring in profits and be sustainable in a way. But that also means that you're going to ignore quite a big percentage of people who need most your intervention and your impact. So as you are, maybe the question is, when you're trying to innovate or come up with you know, social enterprise that addresses challenges, how do you make sure that you're not literally also part of the problem in a way that you're going to disaggregate, but also uh, ignore the most disadvantaged people because the, these people don't have the capacity to help you sustain your business. How do you bridge that gap? Thank you. Thank you. May I suggest we take two or three questions and then, then we ask panelists to volunteer. We'll go here and then we'll go at the top. Please. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Devia. Uh, you mentioned that we're in the midst of a poly crisis, and because of the pandemic, we've seen unprecedented change and challenges. And I was wondering, for the next 20 years, how are you um, ensuring that you're building capacity for resilience and adaptability just in case we face another unprecedented challenge going forward? Please, over here, and then we'll go to the top, and then we'll give the panel the... Uh, Hello. Does this work? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, hello everyone. I'm Stefan from the Fogarat Research Institute in Romania. Um, I, I was thinking um, more about the future and um, as we're talking about social uh, entrepreneurship, uh, I was wondering if you see a change in societal sectors, meaning social entrepreneurship brings together business and uh, civil society in a sense, NGOs. Are we moving away from both of these sectors to bring them together, in a sense, in social entrepreneurship? What does this tell us about how society is changing in general? Thank you. I guess if Gregory's vision becomes reality, all of us working on social change will be part of a stock exchange quite soon. <laughs> <laughs> so that will be interesting. <laughs> anyway, Sakina. Um, my name is Sakina Yakubi, and I am so glad to be here. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you that and Sabine and also um, uh, Mabel, they are both working with girls' education and all around the world. And I want to just share with you that how about the girls in Afghanistan? What's going to happen to the people <coughs> of Afghanistan? Especially that they, uh, right now they are out of the radar. And not only um, the girls and women of Afghanistan are suffering, but also the whole complete society of Afghanistan are suffocating and dying there because of poverty, because there is no job, because no, no, not there any opportunity, and uh, their voice is not here. So I just want to see what we are going to do. We are talking here about the next 20 years. How about that now? What we are going to do about that country that also their asset has been frozen, and the money is not going into Afghanistan and getting money to the people of Afghanistan and to support them, it's very, very hard. So what we are going to do as an entrepreneur, as somebody, as a uh, leader of the world that we all are here claiming that we are reaching millions and mil millions, which we are. And so what we are going to do about that, that's my question. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you for bringing the girls of Afghanistan into the room, Sakina. Um, we had a question about how to reach the most disenfranchised. We had a question about how to build capacity and resilience for future 
of nightmares. The so change of societal sectors, do we envision this happening? And then the girls of Afghanistan. Don't reply, each of you, to every question because we won't have enough time. Who wants to take any of these questions? I can take one on resiliency and adaptability. Go for it. Um, because I feel like uh, for us, uh, COVID really was a test um, and allowed us to learn a lot. Um, going into 2020, um, I was leading an organization that had a budget of about $2 million. Um, we had a staff of about six, 11, 16, I don't remember. Um, and our focus at that time, we had done things like develop the cybersecurity training that the federal government purchased to train local election departments on cybersecurity. So we were a training organization. We built tooling for these local election officials. But as we got into the election year, because there was also a presidential election in 2020, those election departments um, were running out of money to just do the basics of administering elections. They had zero budget to do things like keep polling locations safe to not become super spreader events, um, or to even for larger jurisdictions get the machinery that was gonna be required to get ballots out and then count them in a timely way with as many people that had to switch voting methods because of the pandemic. So um, fast forward a few months um, and I found myself leading an organization um, that had gone from, again, $2 million budget and staff that's focused on capacity building of election departments to instead responding to that core, most pressing challenge that we were hearing from election departments, which was funding. And we ended up leading a program where we raised $350 million from private philanthropy that we then regranted to 2,500 election departments <clears throat> across 48 states that allowed them to have the resources to be able to fund the shifts that they needed to be able to make to safely and securely serve voters across the United States that election. Our team had never regranted to election departments before. Um, and we were able to move a government size amount of money across 10 weeks. And the reason that we were able to do that, I think were a few things. One of them, uh, and things that we will take into the future when we have to think about resilience and adaptability. We were able to be adaptable because we knew who our core um, beneficiary or customer or client or what, uh, the core person, our core audience were election officials. And our core mission is to make sure that they are successful in serving voters. And we knew that in that moment, even if we did what we did best training, it wasn't going to actually solve the problem if they didn't have resources. So we knew what we had to shift to based on our audience um, and listening. Um, and we also knew what we were best at. We had a set of skills that were transferable um, around building technology, um, around listening, around applying that to a scaled program. And so we were focused on knowing what we did best and shifting that to the core problem that we were hearing that was most important that was needed in that moment. And so listening, knowing your core audience, knowing what you do best, um, and then figuring out ways in a moment of response to shift those um, so they're in alignment to what is most needed. Thank you. Can I jump Please, in yeah. Too? I want to talk about the sustainability issue. Our friend from Rwanda talked about it and resilience just quickly. I would say in the Root Capital's case, one of the hypotheses early on for us was we were going to crowd in a ton of commercial banks. And we've done that in many countries, but in many cases, the economics are simply not there. There's not enough market solution to reach those communities that are going to be left out. So that going back to you have, we have to create a, a sector-wide evidence base that brings lots of blended capital in that is philanthropy with lots of transparency and data mixed with impact investing and, and guarantees and so on because you need, we need to, be, especially in the context of climate crisis, we need to absorb the risk as, an, as a, um, a blended capital uh, movement, if you will, that's required to be able to reach the communities that where a market solution might be relevant but, but in the case of northern Latin America, you had two super storms in two, in two weeks, or in the case of many of our clients, we work in Laden Coffee in Rwanda, there are deluges, rainstorms to the point where a crevasse opens up and three people in a processing plant are taken, or uh, drown, et cetera. So I think it's really important to embrace the fact that commercial, we, we have proudly said, and in being cheeky, but it's kind of serious, we are at the high risk, negative return, sweet spot of smallholder agricultural finance. <laughs> and then on resilience side, just back to the climate crisis, I feel like what, in our case, um, along with kind of our, our sector, how do we create the financial plumbing 
to create practical, very scalable pathways of capital for what? At a small hurdle level, local communities investing in solar generation, investing in tree planting, investing in, in um, and maybe monetizing mitigation of carbon, of climate change to pay for climate adaptation and climate resilience. That's really, really important, which is why we are so focused on, we gotta get 1.7% of total climate finance, global climate finance going to $2.5 billion. That's not just a moral failure, it's a massive missed opportunity to direct resources to frontline communities who have a big part of the solution. And then and lastly, I, I, I speak on behalf of a, a lot of school awardees, and we're one of them who got McKinsey Scott funding last year. Resilience, it's the first time we've really been able to invest in our team in a way we never have before and to, and to strengthen our own balance sheet because shit, this, it, this stuff is hard <laughs> and it's a hurricane, it's a civil war, um, in particular on the climate side and it's reaching these frontline communities in a way where our organizations deserve to be super resilient as well. And so let's not like criminalize overhead, et cetera, uh, but actually that, amen to trust-based philanthropy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, the one thing I'll add just briefly is that social entrepreneurship should never be seen as a substitute to effective government, right? Like, it should be seen as a bridge. Like, when I serve communities, I don't do that because I want to give the government a free pass. The government collects taxes. The government should use the taxes to provide free services to the customers that I cannot serve because there is no market-based solution to serve them. But if I can free the government from also having to take its scarce resources to also provide services to those that can pay, then the government can direct its resources into the poorest of the poor. And that's what I see as social entrepreneurship being complementary to the social services that governments have to provide. But I think as entrepreneurs, sometimes we go too far of thinking that by doing our work, we should sort of give governments a free pass. But that is wrong. You should make sure that governments are held accountable for the taxes they collect, and they direct those taxes to serve the poorest of the poor, who we as social enterprises cannot serve with market-based solutions. Mm -hmm. Safina, do you want to say anything about the girls of Afghanistan? Absolutely. Um, Sakina is somebody I've looked up to for a very long time. I also want to remind people that in all of this that's happening with climate change and stuff, gender really comes at the bottom of this. When we talk about what's coming with climate, women and girls will be 14x more likely to die of climate disasters, not because of our biology, but because of our marginalization. Afghanistan is a prime example of where it's going, but I also want to make a broader point. During COVID, we looked at a lot of data because we knew that girls will go the hungriest because even in normal times in our societies, women and girls eat last. And so as these crises multiply, as these crises come at us, our women and girls are going to be at the heart and center of the ones carrying the burden of this. So let's just be very clear. And Afghanistan, I mean, Sakin, you know what? Sakina needs around $3 million. And I think school, uh, foundation, everybody who's here, and in this ecosystem, I think we can all actually work to make sure that she has the resources to do what she needs to do. And I think we all have that capacity. So Sakina, I'm gonna make a personal contribution to you. I am going to urge everybody that I meet during the forum to find your number, and I have your number, so I'm gonna give your number to everyone. Uh, and we will, I think, in this room, just make sure that when you leave the forum, Sakina, you have multitudes more supporters because it's absolutely heart-rending. It's heart-rending what is happening, and you have spent your whole life, and it breaks my heart that after, what is it, 33 years of what you're doing, that you have to stand in this room and you have to say this. It truly breaks my heart. So absolutely, we are all here, and we are with you. Thank you. Now, uh, we're really quickly going to take two or three more comments and questions, and then I'm going to ask a final question to all the, the, the panelists. The lady over there, then we'll go here, then we'll go here, and <laughs> I'm sorry, we're, <laughs> we're running out of time. Otherwise, I might be disinvited next year. 
I wouldn't want to risk that. Please. I'm Hannah, uh, I'm based in Belgium uh, and work at Filier Finance Be Europe Association. Um, I was wondering, we're discussing foresight and we're discussing the future here uh, and the crisis, the challenges uh, that we're talking about are really long term. At the same time, we're discussing time horizons of two years or three years or five years, uh, whereas investments that need to be done uh, need a time horizon of 10 years, like if we talk about agriculture, uh, or 20 years to really see the, uh, the results and the impact. What would, you, uh, what would you need now, what would we need now to be better at planning really long term and having actions and also knowing that the dark forces are actually investing very long term uh, in uh, undermining democratic governments uh, and there are a multitude of other examples. What do we need now to be better at long term planning and visions uh, 10 years, 20 years from now? Thank you. The lady over there and then the lady here in the front, please. Hi. My name is Asma Bilal and I'm with MSI Reproductive Choices. Um, I just wanted to uh, pick up on something that uh, Willie was saying earlier about intersectoral partnerships and coalitions. Because while we uh, maintain our focus, as Safina would say, our laser sharp focus on our chosen areas of expertise and our work, how do we ensure that we are also collaborating uh, and working uh, cross sector? So for example, listening to Safina's work and reflecting on that, why women are dropping out of school? Why are they unable to continue their education? I mean, early marriages, unintended pregnancies, lack of access to safe contraception, those are some of the factors that are contributing big time to girls not being able to continue with education. And that's where those partnerships become so important with other organizations that are working towards that. So I think just, um, just a brief comment to say that those intersectoral partnerships are absolutely critical and while we are focusing on our areas, we get too caught up with the work that we are doing, but sometimes not being able to forge those partnerships across sectors. Yeah. It's a very good point, and it's very interesting that the School Foundation is, is under its new strategy, much more focusing at where some of these big problems actually come together. But <coughs> let's hear from the panel on that as well. But we do need to work much more cross-sectoral and at these, at these you know, points where, where things come together. Over to you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Liz Gillies from the Menzies Foundation, focused on leadership. I just wanted to ask a question of the panel. When you sit in these forums and you're surrounded by the extraordinary people in this room, there's a sense of common purpose. But out in the world, in intersectionality, in cross-sector collaborations, there are vastly different views on what we need to solve the world's problems. Mm. One of the key things are the leadership attributes we need to cultivate to work in complex contexts. And I just wonder on the panel members, what's your leadership superpower and um, what's the leadership attribute you want to cultivate as you contemplate the next 10 years? I love it, leadership superpower. Um, there we go, timing, long versus short term, uh, the question of cross-sector collaboration and then for each of you, your superpower. Um, who wants to go on timing issues or cross-sectoral? I mean, I'll just say back to this idea of the stock exchange for social innovation. I mean, one of the wonders of capitalism was that being able to open up anyone being a shareholder of a business allowed companies to raise billions of, 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 of dollars. I mean, think of space companies, you know, the clean energy revolution, with companies listing to raise the capital that they need. That allows them to actually make long-term investment. And I think we need something like that for social innovation, where you can have long-term investors that can actually become sure, democratize ownership of social innovation. Um, and while it's not a problem I think I can solve now, I really, really think that foundations together in this room should start thinking of how we create an exchange to drive more, um, um, uh, to crowd more long-term capital where every individual you know, sitting there can buy $10 of shares in them pharma one day, um, and that capital can be redeployed uh, to uh, solve more problems. And as we grow and we do better, um, we also earn a return on that investment uh, from them. For my leadership, so actually I did just say the Leadership Circle program earlier this year, it was a very, um, because I was like, you know, you, you get to feel, think of who you think you are, and then you, know, you get to know what people think you are. And I think it's a very big uh, you know, punch to your ego a little bit before you then readjust. But 
I fundamentally believe that in my own journey at M Pharma, you start as a founder, and there's a unique skill set that makes you a founder, but a founder does not make you a CEO. And one of the things that I had to learn was to actually make the decision that I want to transition from being a founder to being a CEO. Because being a CEO is not just about the vision, the inspiration, it's the real basic things, organizational structure, you know, you know, you know, you know, the cadence of meetings and like all those boring <laughs> things, like really boring things as a, from a founder perspective, they are very boring things um, that you, you end up, you know, doing. And I don't think it's for everyone. And I always have great respect for founders who reach a point and say, you know what, this administrative CEO job is not for me, I'm gonna hire a CEO. And I think some, those that do it well see that transition, and there are those who say, I actually want to become that, and I need to learn. Because you have to learn to be a good leader. You have to learn to be a CEO. And that's been a journey that I've been on myself. Actually, that learning path to being a good CEO. We're soon gonna run out of time. Safina, what is your superpower? My superpower is, I think, I think it's uh, listening. Um, I've had 16 year olds go down to the project, come back and saying, you are rubbish. And I'm like, why? And then they will tell me saying, you did this, you did this, but just having the capacity to constantly listen and absorb feedback and to be able to see things differently from where you might be sitting or you're sitting, all of us, our angles are different. So I would say that simply would be a superpower. Thank you. Tiana, what about you, uh, your superpower? I think to be effectively a field catalyst that helps with cross-sector collaboration, one of the things that um, I do effectively is listen and hear um, how to support organizations, other folks that are in our sector and our ecosystem to productively be in their own lane um, as we drive towards a shared solution. And so that requires really um, not only being able to listen, but to hear like what is driving our potential collaborators, what does success look like for them, and how can we make sure that they're achieving that mutual success while also plugging into something that is a bigger picture and gets us all to our goals that we have around helping democracy be more robust. Um, and so being able to listen and help people plug in, um, I think the last piece of that is um, it requires when you have so many leaders that you need to bring together um, to do that coordinating work, a fair amount of keeping your ego in check. Um, and, and really not centering yourself, but centering the challenges that you're working on. Um, and I work to really center those challenges and not myself um, every day so that we are most focused on what's most important. Thank you. Billy? For me, I think <clears throat> my superpower is being a translational force between, uh, with humility and joy, hopefully, um, as much as I can muster it sometimes between owners of capital and people who have power and communities that have solutions. And sometimes you go to extreme um, um, measures. For instance, I can think of an example where I wrote a song <clears throat> about a CFO of a Fortune 500 company, and I sang it in our meeting, <laughs> and it was a totally out-of-body experience. <laughs> For him, and we got the and we got the investment. <laughs> and he jokes about it to this day. Oh my gosh, that's a secret uh, tool that some of us might uh, might try. Look, I believe that we can all make a difference, and nobody can do it alone. And if I look at my career, um, I believe that the thing uh, that 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 has kind of that might be my superpower is that I I really believe that I'm quite good at matchmaking and trying to actually make it possible for those who do the real work and those who are at the, f the forefront of creating changing communities in the lives of individuals to try to help to match them with governments, donors, strategies of change. And, um, and I just hope that I'll continue to matchmake um, for many years and with many of you. Because as Archbishop Tutu would say, you know, if you want big change to happen, you need an enormous wave of change. And we should never forget that an enormous wave of change is composed of millions of drops of water. And you are one, and you are one, and you are one, and I am one, and he is one, and she is one, and everybody can be one. And I think we need to create the waves of change. Now we're gonna wrap this up by each of them is gonna give all of you one piece of advice, one thought that as you leave this room, you will <coughs> hopefully take with you and spread. 
Who wants to start? Not me. A drop of <laughs> wisdom. <laughs> go for it. She's there. Savina, you want to go? No, I think he's going to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, language matters. And as we all leave here, we should think of whether we are gatekeepers or gate openers. <clears throat> In a world where it is easier to be a gatekeeper, I think that we should all inspire uh, to be gate openers. I remember starting my own journey and the people who had <coughs> you know, random moments of kindness who pick up the phone and call someone who knew me from anywhere. And that has been something that said as a catalyst for me to get to where I am today. And within the organization at M Pharma, I try when we have a lot of young people join the company to also be gate opener. So I think as we leave, let's aspire. It's easier <coughs> to be a gatekeeper, much harder to be a gate opener, but let's all aspire to be gate openers because you never know who is in this room, who you may be the break out opportunity for him or her to be able to achieve their dreams. Yeah. yeah. Oh. No, no, please. First of all, I think everybody here in this room is going to be a gate opener for Sek uh, Sek you know, Sekina today. Uh, and, uh, and I think for me, um, just take care of yourself. I find like if I manage my own energy, I can kind of do anything. But it's very hard to do, but I think first just sort of channel inwards, take care of your own energy so that we're not in reactive mode, but we're in like really <coughs> authentic <coughs> responding mode to stuff that's sort of coming our way. Um, I would say for folks who are leading organizations, it is as important to invest in building a stronger organization as it is to deliver on your mission. Um, we make sure that our managers have leadership coaches. We care about management and culture as much as we do about improving democracy. And for the funders in the room, to echo something that Willie was saying earlier, um, it is critical to be able to invest in the things that can be seen as overhead, but actually are what you need to have an organization that is resilient and adaptable and collaborative um, and can come together um, regularly to um, align around shared vision and then execute that. And I would, <clears throat> as we're kicking off the, the, um, so much of the substance of the School World Forum, I would really focus on leaning into people in connection and this community um, for two reasons. One, it feels to me, apropos to our conversation here, that it is an incredible community of practice around systems change and around systems orchestration. It's the best um, kitchen cabinet you can find. And then I think the second one is building community care, as Safina said. And there are amazing resources, the, the Wellbeing Project, um, if anybody wants to learn about Tendril, which is like Young President's Organization meets the social entrepreneurship world, having a kitchen cabinet, having a safe place to go in a neighborhood near you or virtual neighborhood. Um, Tendril, by the way, is the, the Tibetan word for interdependence and mutuality. And maybe most importantly, I'm, I'm looking at Sally Osberg up in the front here because I think um, without... Um, Sometimes we have breathless anxiety when we think about the challenges, but what we need to do is embrace the joy and the energy that comes from being together and making it fun. And some of the funnest moments of my entire life were playing folk songs with uh, Sally on Friday evening, year after year. Sometimes Jeff would, would join us and just belting out songs. And Bill McKibben talks a lot about this in Singing with Sunrise Movement. Music, joy, make it fun because this is really hard work and that energy actually will drive our mission and our impact. Building on that, let me just add one thing. <clears throat> Do not forget to dance today at the award ceremony. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to the panel. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to our friends of Skoll who make this possible. <laughs>